Hi, my name is Anthony P, and I'm an American living in Taiwan. I give seminars on academic writing and publishing to the top universities in Asia. This seminar on how to write an abstract was given at Taiwan's top-ranked university, National Taiwan University, to the Department of Civil Engineering. Invite me to your campus. Thanks. Now on to my super clear seminar on how to write an abstract. Can I take my mask? Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah. Um, my name is Anthony. I'm from the U.S. and I'm with UniEdit. And today we're going to talk about abstracts, my favorite part of a research paper. Um, before we get started, who's written an abstract before? Okay, maybe half the class. Good. Who does not know what an abstract is? Good. Okay. All right. Um, and um, today's lesson plan is about two hours long. Halfway through, we'll take a five minute break. Um, so about an hour from now, five minute break. There's a couple of sections for questions. Uh, definition of an abstract. An abstract is a self-contained, short, and definitive summary that describes the full contribution or content of an academic publication. An abstract can be read by itself. We're going to talk a lot about this last part, that an abstract can be read by itself. It's difficult to take your entire presentation and put it into a small paragraph, right? You spend hours and hours writing 20, 30, 40 pages, and then you need one paragraph for the whole thing. Uh, that's hard. That's why we're doing this today. That's why I have two hours with you, because that is a challenge. Uh, to start, <laughs> If I asked you to describe this car, it's pretty easy. You can tell me about the color. You can probably tell me about the materials, the tires, the age of the car, when it was made, maybe what materials were used to paint it. It's easy because it's really big. But if I asked you to describe this car, it would be a lot more difficult. You could do that really quick. That's a small yellow car. It's easier to describe this so this is, it's kind of an analogy. This is your abstract. It's really a very small representation of a bigger piece of work. To push this analogy forward, there are many illustrations of the same thing, but they're all cars. And the, the point of this is to say, we have, I gotta look at this, there we go. Real, realistic, cartoon, technical, schematic, and a child's abstract. Your research paper is up here, right? And it takes, this is your, this is the months and months of writing. Um, but this says the same thing. So when you're writing your abstract, just keep that in mind, because this, this gets difficult when you really get into it. This is the same thing as this. It's just a different representation. Goals of an abstract part one. I'm going to move through these a little quickly so we can spend more time on the real examples. Uh, you're going to ask yourself, should I read the entire article? Is it relevant? Is it trustworthy? Uh, is it interesting? When I say trustworthy, that means is, if it's well written, you trust the author. If you don't understand the abstract, you don't trust the author. So trustworthy, when you read the abstract, you're determining, should I read the entire article, or do I go find a new paper? If you don't understand the abstract, you're not going to understand the article. And then, is it interesting? Does it capture your attention? Uh, how technical and sophisticated? Is it too technical? Is it too simple? Some of you are going to write papers on a very specific and technical topic, and you're going to read an abstract that's really simple, and you're going to say, this paper is too simple. I need a more technical paper. So you can actually gauge, you can learn information about the paper really quickly from the abstract. Um, these are what the reader is thinking when reading your abstract. We're making decisions very quickly about your entire semester's work in just about a minute or two. Goals part two, screening by journals. When you're submitting to a journal, uh, if you have a good abstract, you, you proceed to the review stage. Maybe you get rejected, um, screening by conferences, uh, accepted or rejected, and then easy to remember core findings. 
Yeah, so journals and conferences, they use abstracts to, to filter. It's a filter. And if your abstract's well written, you make the pass. Uh, keep a copy of abstracts after reading the full paper. It's good, easy to remember core findings. Part three, search engine optimization. When you're searching for an, uh, an article in your field, easy, easy to scan hundreds of abstracts online to find relevant research. Abstract cross-referencing. This helps researchers discover new research areas and topics that were previously unknown when they began their research. Uh, this is when you compare, cross-referencing is when you compare multiple abstracts to each other, multiple papers to each other. And four, academic institutions and corporations will often publish abstracts and make them available to other researchers. Yep. Uh, the abstract sells your work. Your abstract is probably the most like salesperson you should be in your paper. Um, okay, now we're gonna, I don't wanna do that. This seems normal. You write your abstract and then you write your paper. We don't actually like this. This is probably not a good idea. The abstract comes first, right? You have your title, your abstract, then introduction methodology, stuff like that. But because your abstract has all the parts of your paper, you're, you're gonna wanna actually write your paper, <laughs> your abstract last, after you've done your full paper. So your abstract comes months after you start writing. You're gonna write most of your paper, or at least a good outline of your paper, before you write your abstract. So, an abstract is nice because you get a lot of time to think about it, but you don't need to rush. You need to do it at the end. Well, maybe you need to rush. I'm not sure. When to write the abstract. Write the abstract last after the paper is drafted. Your article determines the abstract. Your abstract does not determine your article. Cool. A strong abstract, quick list, tells the reader what to expect, summarizes the contributions, uh, attracts the reader to read the full paper, has just enough quantitative results, easy to full, e hmm, is fully self-contained, and makes sense all by itself. And abstracts differ by field. Are you all in the same degree program? I don't think so. All engineering department? Okay, so similar enough, similar enough. Uh, well then good, I can <laughs> breeze through this a little bit. Parts of an abstract vary according to discipline. Here's gonna be your scientific research. Uh, in your abstract, you're gonna have motivation, problem statements, method, results, and discussion. Generally speaking, this is what you will all have in your, in your abstract. Uh, seems easy enough, right? Um, humanities will be a little different. Hypotheses, uh, background, and conclusions might be included. Um, it's good that you're all in here together because then your checklist will be the same. And when you proofread each other's abstracts, um, you'll, uh, you know what to look for. It's good. Uh, length of the abstract. I would love to say every abstract is 150 words. That's not true. Um, every journal might be different. Conference abstracts might be different. Theses and dissertations might be different. I would say generally, this middle one is your most common, uh, but it depends. It depends. Um, here are the different types of abstracts. If you continue with your academic career, you may write most of these in different papers. Uh, so be flexible with yourself. The most two common are at the top, journal paper abstracts and conference paper abstracts. But then you can write research grants, you can write literature reviews, experimental reports, master's theses abstracts, doctoral th dissertation abstracts, tweetable abstracts, that's a good one, uh, video abstracts and graphical abstracts. But they all do the same thing. They're all representing your work in few words. Language style for the abstract. Uh, I wanna stop here for a second. So your paper is academic English, right? Your abstract is, is a little different because you don't really use citations in your abstract. 
You don't use industry jargon, which are really specific terms. You use more easily understood terms. Can I slide this over? Um, your abstract sells your work, so it's, it's a little more persuasive than your article. So let's talk about it. Search and use exact phrases so they will turn up at the top of a search listing. That's your key terms. This is like Googleable. Can you Google the paper? Or is the paper impossible to find? Uh, each sentence typically represents a section of your paper. Typically represents, not always. Uh, there is room for creativity as parts may be merged or spread among a set of sentences. In your abstract, it's not uncommon to see your literature review and your problem statement may be in the same sentence. Right? You might be able to combine multiple parts of your paper. Um, staccato style is acceptable. What's staccato? Any musicians? Anybody play music? Nobody plays music. Staccato is like a choppy. Choppy. You don't need a lot of transition words in your abstract. Therefore, furthermore, those help with flow. But in an abstract, that's less important because you're, it can be very short, right? Your abstract is short, so those are waste of words. Flow is less important in an abstract. Be concise. Long sentences don't really help the reader understand what you want to say to them. Short sentences make sense. Concise sentences make sense. Be authoritative. Correct example, we implemented a novel approach and evaluated efficiency gains. Weak example, we attempted to try. See the feeling difference? We wanted to do this. <laughs> we tried, nah, we implemented, we did it. We established, we studied, we examined. Be authoritative. Language style continued. Don't provoke the reader into searching for more information by using vague or unclear language. Oh, I love this example. A significant improvement in... This sounds really academic, right? We say this in academ academia. It's a significant improvement. But what does that mean? 5%? 20%? 100%? You should definitely do it, or maybe you should do it. So this is, this is really vague. And this tells the reader, oh, you need to read my article. No, no let's skip that. Just tell them. A 24% increase in. Don't tell me it's important. I know it's important by your data. And your abstract will have one or two key data points. Um, don't compliment your own work. <laughs> Our groundbreaking study are magnificent, yeah, stuff like that. Avoid jargon and abbreviations. Um, again, jargon, uh, specific terms that you use uh, in your industry. I don't have any good examples at the moment. We will later. Consider the viewpoints of a diverse readership when writing your abstract. Rare, uh, rarely will the reader have back your background knowledge. Your background knowledge. You're writing this paper. You know everything. You know the participants, you know the location, you know the findings, the discussion. The person reading your abstract knows nothing. So it's easy to write an abstract that's too difficult for the average reader. It's really easy. So have your, nobody has your background knowledge. So we need to explain it to them. Uh, keywords, really quick, most publications request keywords. This is good for indexing, how they organize abstracts in their database. Online searches, um, helpful to assign papers to review committees or editors when your, uh, your paper's fate. Um, you're all civil engineering. Maybe if you're working on bridges, then your keywords will get your paper assigned to maybe peer reviewers that have experience publishing civil engineering with bridge construction. Uh, we'll set... Hmm. Will your set of keywords be truly unique? It's a good question. Do you need unique keywords? If there are a thousand papers with your same keywords, your paper is going to be really difficult to find. So I would say some of your keywords are going to be similar. 
but you should try to find a couple of unique keywords or a unique combination of keywords so your paper can be identified. Uh, you find the keywords at the end of an abstract. This is what I'm talking about. So we can see value engineering, value management, education and research, professional institution, Hong Kong. It's like Hong Kong, yeah, that's a location. You don't always need a location, but maybe this paper was location focused. It's, it's only relevant to Hong Kong, potentially. Uh, here's another example. Low voltage, distribution networks, Monte Carlo, voltage drop, voltage imbalance. Want me as your personal online English teacher for regular one-to-one -one lessons, or even just for one lesson? Visit the UniEdit website link below for more details on how to book. Uh, abstracts and reputations. Well-written abstracts show respect for other researchers. That's an idea for you, right? How can an abstract show respect for other researchers? Any ideas? This is a question. How can, how can an abstract show respect? Professor? Oh, interesting. So if you're, cite, if you're citing a different source, maybe? Okay. You, well, tell me, tell me if you agree with this. It saves them time. If your abstract is really clear and concise, you're going to save people time. A difficult abstract might take five or ten minutes to understand. A clean abstract takes one minute, sometimes 30 seconds, um, and it aids in their research process. Many people reading your abstract, they're writing their own paper, right? People that read your abstract, they're, you know, they want to know if they want to cite your paper. And that's when you read theirs as well. Well-written abstract leads to a good first impression. It's the first thing they read. Writing process. Uh, rough draft. Have an abstract structure checklist to-do list. We're going to do this today. Um, I'll show you many versions of, of how does an abstract flow. Uh, and you should be thinking about this when writing yours. Write a few sentences for each section of your article. This is not concise yet. You're not writing your abstract. So when you have your introduction finished, write two or three sentences about your introduction. Summarize your introduction. When you finish your methodology, summarize your methodology. And this will form the basic framework for your abstract. Assemble those sentences, put them all together. Trim back by removing unnecessary details. Uh, this is what we'll spend most of our time on later in this session. How do we write big ideas concisely? It takes years of practice. Um, trim back by editing the language. Have a colleague review and critique your abstract. This is a huge part of academia. You're, all team, you're, in a, you're on a team together. You're on a graduating team. You will read each other's abstracts and help, and people will read yours and help. And then revise. Revise, edit it, do it again. Writing process, revise. Edit carefully, requires several drafts. Ask a colleague to examine the abstract. Having new sets of eyes to check your abstract can offer new perspectives, perspectives you've never seen before. It can also help you detect new errors and better ways to frame your sentences better ways to frame your sentences. This could be changing the position of two sentences. One of your friends might say, I think this sentence goes better up here. It's good. It, it takes another person to know that sometimes. Okay, write better abstracts part one. These are tips. Get ideas. I'm gonna check the time really quick. Good, we're making great time. Get ideas from other abstracts in peer-reviewed journals and apply them to your abstracts. Get ideas from other abstracts and peer-reviewed journals and apply them to your abstract. For, for me, I can tell pretty quickly if an abstract was written by a native English speaker or edited by a native English speaker or if it was written by um, someone internationally. That doesn't mean the English was bad. That can mean the flow or the feeling was a little different. There are many people that are fluent in English writing, not from the United States, right? However, when getting ideas, 
you should be getting your ideas from the best journals in your field. Look at the best examples. Don't waste time in, in open access journals. Just go right to the biggest, most important journals because those papers have been edited by five people. Those papers have been internationally reviewed and that's where you want to get your ideas from. And then apply them to your abstract. Maybe use their keywords, use their grammatical structures. Do not copy and paste, that's illegal. Um, but use their ideas. Uh, emulate their style and apply those suitable to your own paper. Continued part two. Sorry. Observe the key points that authors selected to use in their abstracts to be published at your target journals. Observe their key points. Um, journals have really specific papers that they want to publish. Um, I spoke with a professor last, maybe, maybe a month ago, um, NTNU, NTUN. <laughs> Taiwan. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. NTUST. That's right. I always, uh, it's so difficult for me. Yeah. Um, and, and she said that when she goes to publish one of her papers in a journal, the, one journal will say, mm, this is more IT focused. And then she goes to the IT journal and she says, mm, no, this, this journal is more civil engineering focused. So journals have a really specific idea, a target audience. So if you have a journal you want to publish in, really study those abstracts that are published. Take your time, highlight dozens of abstracts, find their keywords, find what the journal is looking for, find the patterns between the abstracts in the journals you want to publish in. Or read all of your professor's paper and copy them and then they'll love you. <laughs> oh, I like these, I like these keywords. I recognize them. Have professors, colleagues, and editors critique your abstract. Again, this is a critiquing and editing peer review. This is a fact of your life now, right? This is a fact. Get used to it. Be happy with it and, and participate in the process. Frame your abstract like your article. I believe we're going to talk about framing, and then we take a break, and then we give examples of framing, and we'll do some um, activities with framing. So this is. probably my favorite part of the presentation. Follow a standard checklist, we talked about that. Frame your abstract the way that your article is written. Generally, your article is introduction, methodology, results, discussion, conclusion. Your ab that's a flow, that's a story. There's a reason you don't start with your methodology. Because you need to know why. And that's what your introduction says. That's what your literature review says. So your abstract should be written similarly. Write the abstract last after your paper is drafted. Good. So the structure of your research paper, I've, I've, I've done something here. Motivation and problem, this is your introduction section. Uh, motivation and problem, those can be, that's your literature review as well. This is background research. Uh, so these are separated into two. And then you should recognize the rest. Motivation, what is the importance of your research? Why would the reader be interested in the larger work? Problem, what problem does this work attempt to solve? What is the scope of the project? What is the main argument, thesis, or claim? Uh, specific models or approaches used to, use are the types of evidence used in the research. Specific data that indicates the results of the project. And discussion, interpret the results to reach the main conclusions, how does this work add to the body of knowledge, practical or theoretical applications from your findings or implications of future research. Uh, if I had to read one section of every paper, I might choose the discussion section. Because this is when the author tells you, hey, my research is important because this is how the industry will be affected, this is what you should do. That's maybe a personal preference. Some people love the results section. Um, yeah, how does your work add to the body of knowledge? And we'll show, I'll show you later, discussions is a great place to end an abstract. To keep that in mind, a discussions is a good place to end the abstract. 
And then conclusions is a short summary. So that was the structure of a paper. This is the structure of an abstract. This is a little more detail. So motivation, why do we care? Why do we care about the problem and the results? Why is it interesting? This is a sales piece. Why, why should I be interested? What's the importance of your work? The difficulty of the area and the impact it might have if, success, if successful? Uh, the difficulty of the area, one of the abstracts we're gonna look at today started with this in their paper, and I loved it. Um, it started with the difficulty of the research area, which is really clever, and uh, yeah, it's great. Reasons for conducting the research. Uh, never lose sight of why the research was conducted. I like this one because you are all so focused on, on your paper. It's obvious to you why your paper is important. It's your grade, it's your graduation, it's your degree, maybe it's your field of interest. But for other people, for me, for people in another department, it's a little, it's a little more complicated why your research is important. Problem statement, uh, what problem are you trying to solve? What is the scope of your work? Is it a generalized approach or is it for a specific situation? Uh, be careful not to use too much jargon. Those are industry phrases. For some cases, put the problem statement before the motivation, but this usually only works if most readers understand why the problem is important. We all know cancer is bad, right? Cancer is a problem. Okay, that can go before. But if uh, a specific example is hard for this one. Um, if it's obvious, put it, put it first. If it's not obvious, put it second. Methodology. How did you go about solving or making progress on the problem? Uh, did you use a simulation, analytic models, prototype construction, or analysis of field data for an actual product? What is the extent of your work? What important variables did you control, ignore, or measure? Um, I find that people struggle a lot with the methodology in the abstract. Because uh, when you write your methodology, it's really specific language and it's really, you're trying to describe a really big idea, right? How did you get your results? And to put that into one or two sentences is, is, is challenging. But these are gonna be your focuses. I think there's one, no. Uh, results. What's the answer? Uh, is it faster, more efficient, safer, cheaper, more reliable? This is where you want to be authoritative. A 23% increase in efficiency. This is what we're talking about. Uh, use the main numerical results. You might have a thousand. <laughs> you might have data sheets of results. Just use the main one. One, two, three. General rule. If it's five or six, ugh, that gets confusing may be possible, I don't know. Um, keep, keep the number small though. Avoid vagueness, very small or significant, let's be specific. Some abstracts may discuss the findings in a more general way, that's okay. Uh, if, if, I like this, if, if the study was done in Taiwan, but it can have implications around the world, then it might be a more general discussion. Um, maybe that's a good example. Uh, discussion, what are, the, uh, sorry, what are the implications of, your, of the answer? Is it going to change the world? That's unlikely. You're all doing research and it probably won't change the world. It might be a piece of a puzzle that changes the world, but your paper might not. But it might be a significant win. It might be a nice hack. Just let us know, that's your, that's the, that's your ending. Are the results general, potentially generalizable, or specific to a particular case? Um, yeah, good. And ramifications. What changes should be implemented as a result of the findings of the work? How does this work add to the body of knowledge on a topic? What changes should be implemented as a result of the findings? Many times this is just we suggest construction companies use our model, right? If it's, uh, let's say you're doing earthquake, um, what would it be called? 
earthquake proofing a building. And if it's a suggestion for the general industry, hey, we, we show good results with our, with our models. We suggest that you use them. You can predict you know, future damage. It can be, can be pretty straightforward like that. Hey guys. I give live presentations to university students around Asia on this topic and on similar academic writing and publishing topics. To invite me to your university, you can reach out to me via email. Thanks, and I'll talk to you soon. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so your question is, I've talked a lot about research, like papers, full journal papers. Specifically, how do you write a conference abstract when maybe you don't even have results? The short answer is don't put results in your, <laughs> in your abstract. If it's an ongoing study, say it's ongoing. Um, every conference will have very specific guidelines for your abstract uh, because they will have dozens and dozens and dozens of them and they want them to all fit. Um, a suggestion I do have, if there have been similar studies to yours in the past, you might be able to say, similar studies have found that this was an effective model. We are hoping to improve upon that, right? Take it from there because a lot of the abstract, or a lot of your research paper is talking about past research so that you can do a bit of problem statement and methodology in that one sentence. Um, as you also know, some papers, some studies are like longitudinal studies over a very long period of time, and there's papers written intermittently with the same source data over time. So it could be a situation like that where this study will continue to progress for the next 10 years. Identify these in an abstract. So we've talked a lot about your introduction, your methodology, your results, and your conclusion. What do they look like? What do they look like in an abstract? Let's do it. I will read this, and then the next slide tells you what the, the, the instructions are again. I'll just do it here, okay. Think about which section goes where while I read it. Approximately 15 to 25 of the US percent of the US working population is classified as high risk for job stress. This type of stress is known to exert a psychological toll on workers. Less is known about the impact of job stress on physical health and how current findings translate to clinically relevant outcomes in everyday life, such as susceptibility to the common cold. In an ongoing daily diary study, 68, result, 68 adults completed measures of job stress and upper, upper respiratory infection, URI symptoms, every day for eight weeks. Preliminary analysis, this is funny, preliminary analysis ongoing, yeah, good, <laughs> we're going through. Um, preliminary analyses show that males who had busier days at work on average also endorsed a greater number of total URI symptoms Additionally, males who reported lower perceived job security and less supervisor support were sick with upper respiratory infections on more days across the study than were those with greater job security and supervisor support. Among females, endorsing more busy days, whether at home or at work, was associated with greater endorsement of URI symptoms. The findings explain our understanding of the links between job stress between job stress and immune functioning by elucidating effects on cl clinically relevant health outcomes. You are all engineers and this is a little medical, but it's okay because the key words and the transition words are almost the same. Um, and I'll show you in a second. Introduction section. This might be the easiest one. Can someone tell me where the introduction section ends? We know introduction, okay, approximately. We know it starts there. Where does the introduction end? You can say it or you can raise your hand. Cold, Cold. right here. Yeah, nice job. Clinically relevant outcomes in everyday life, such as susceptibility to common cold. 
How do we know that's the end? Well, what's the methodology? That is an ongoing daily diary study. So that's your methodology. So as soon as you start talking about the study, we know that we've transitioned. Who can tell me when the methodology ends? You're right, there it is, it's on the right side. Because the next sentence, preliminary analyses, analyses being results. Nice job. Uh, where do the results end? Symptoms, all the way down here. So this has a pretty big methodology section. Um, and your results is gonna be down here. The findings expand, um, oh, sorry, the methodology, the other results. Expand our understanding. This can be used in any industry. Um, expand our understanding, that's a really good term. So here's your introduction. Uh, here's your methodology. Oh, I'm sorry, I said methodology took up a lot of time. The results took up a lot of time. Methodology, yeah, I just misspoke. Results, good, and discussion. There we go. Yeah, what's the difference between a discussion and a conclusion? Further research? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a trick question. Uh, in, your in your results section, or no, in your conclusion section, you'll have some discussion. Sometimes the discussion is in the results section. But you're right, specifically discussion, further research. That is absolutely correct. And there are your four, your, your four sections. You see the logical flow? This just moves beautifully between your introduction, so just a little bit, just a little bit of data for past research, and then you read that one sentence and now you know the importance, right? That's your hook. Oh my God, 15 to 25% of US workers are classified for high risk for job stress. That's a problem. And see, there's no citation. We're in the abstract, we don't need a citation. This type of stress, okay, a little bit, a little bit more. What's your problem statement here? What's your problem statement? Less is known, right there, less is known. Beautiful, you can use that in any industry. Less is known. I read that and I say, okay, here's what this study is trying to solve. Your problem statement is, this is <laughs> the, the methodology, this is what we're trying to solve, this is what we're trying to do. Less is known about yada, yada, yada. Um, a little less important for you all. Preliminary analysis, good phrase. Ongoing study. Um, this, and then we can go discussion. The findings expand our understanding of the links between job stress. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're gonna come back to this flow. This, the rest of this presentation is about this flow. It's very difficult to get this, but this is what we want. Um, common mistakes for abstracts. Yeah, 10 minutes, perfect. Mistake number one, not enough attention to writing. I can't explain that, it's perfect. The abstract is usually the first thing people read before going through your article. It's the first impression. And some people rush the abstract. You finish your paper and you type your abstract at the end. Maybe you copy and paste sentences and you're done. Don't do that, don't copy and paste sentences, don't rush it. Um, English grammar or syntax errors, one error loses the trust of your reader. It's very fast. If you, say, if you had a singular and it was supposed to be plural, right, I, I mess that up sometimes. So if you don't, if you don't spend enough time, you're, you're gonna miss those small mistakes and that's where peer review and you helping out each other works a lot. Um, you lose the trust of the reader. Continued, uh, mistake three, withholding main points or concepts to catch the reader's attention. You'll never say, keep reading to find out more. <laughs> it's not a YouTube video, <laughs> you know, watch until the end. Don't do that, <laughs> please don't. <laughs> um, some abstract writers deliberately hold back some or all of the key information of their abstracts to provoke the reader. Um, abstracts should be factual and on point. They are not advertisements. 
continue. Mistake four, including paragraphs. I'm preface this, sometimes you need paragraphs if maybe a dissertation or a thesis. Um, but generally speaking, most abstracts are going to be one paragraph. You will know. If you need multiple paragraphs, you know. Um, when academic and professional institutions, indexing services, and libraries began storing abstracts on online database, databases, the practice of separating abstracts into several paragraphs stopped. It's a little background information. It just makes it a whole lot easier. When you have a thousand papers, you know, one paragraph makes it a lot easier easier to navigate. Using the first sentence of an article as the first line of its abstract. Some people do this. Uh, it's a bit lazy. I think there's a point here. A clean sign of sloppy, lazy work is recycling the same sentences to introduce the abstracts. Um, your abstract is a unique piece of work. Everything in your abstract is unique. It's not in your paper. The information is the same, but the language should be different. The purpose is different. The purpose of your abstract is different than your introduction. Mistake six, including references. We don't need them. Um, unless the conference you are proposing to publish for requires it, never put any reference in your abstract. What you do do is, if remember before I said 15 to 26 percent, in the article, that, will, that fact will come back, and that will be in the references section. So if you use something, you do need it in your, real, in your article, but you don't need the reference in the abstract. Uh, wasting the introduction sentence. Abstracts are fast. We make decisions in 10 to 20 seconds. If your first sentence wastes time, that we lose trust. Uh, lead sentence should be clear, specific, and not too general. Um, I love it when the first sentence is a problem statement or a really interesting fact. Uh, that might be a personal preference, but I think that's, a, I think that's a, good, a good way to start. Mistake eight, too many abbreviations, jargon, and language shortcuts. We've talked about this now three times. If you're using very difficult industry terms, that makes your abstract difficult to read. Everybody doesn't know what you know. When you write your paper, you're now the smartest person on your paper. So you need to use more generalizable keywords. In, you know, engineering language is okay, right? But something very, very specific. Uh, referencing a table, figure, or any part of the main document. Figure two shows. No, don't. We're not. We're not doing that in your abstract. That's for your. That's for your paper. That's for your results section. There are thousands of English editors on the web. How can you choose? How can you know who to trust with your research paper? That's where UniEdit English Editing comes in. UniEdit is a team of over 100 native English speakers with advanced degrees in all major academic fields. To have your research paper edited by a professional in your field, please visit the link below. So uh, in an engineering paper methodology, if you copied the methodology of a previous paper but you changed some things, how do you say that? Um, maybe I would need to see the paper specifically, but you could say we designed a model based off of a 2005 study on the same topic, right? You insert the topic there. Um, we made adjustments to a methodology, a 10-year-old methodology or a popular methodology. Um, or our study was, um, our design was greatly influenced by that could be okay as well. You're right, that last methodology was one sentence, but their results were like four sentences. So your results might be one sentence, and your methodology might be four sentences. So every paper will be different. Um, it's rare if it's like two sentences, two sentences, two sentences. That's probably pretty rare. So if you have a specifically challenging methodology, yeah, why not? Four sentences. I would say more than four, and you're really getting too much. Four is a lot. <laughs> four is a lot. Three is a lot. Two is good. One's great. But if you need two or three, sure. Sure, take the time. Other questions? Uh, let's jump in with an activity. Here's a well-written abstract example. 
We're going, similarly, we're going to identify the parts. So we're going to identify a strong introduction section, a review of the current situation or literature review, concise problem statement, methodology and study information, and key results. Uh, let's start with number one, identify the strong introduction sentence. Well, that's an easy one, right? This study developed. That sounds like methodology. We developed, and kind of is. This is probably in the, in the methodology section. So this study chose to do um, their hook as, huh, how do I say this? So if we look here, um, mine safety procedures during natural disasters that prove the efficiency during natural disasters. It's also a problem statement. So this first sentence does a lot of work. It tells you what they did, and you can assume why. Because natural disasters are dangerous, right? That's people's lives. And we're trying to improve the efficiency. Probably most of your research is based on efficiency. Um, that's engineering, you are the most efficient people in the world. Um, so they were able to do a lot of work in this first sentence. Um, so there's, your, there's your, your strong introduction sentence. What comes next? Taiwan has a comprehensive governmental system dedicated to responding to frequent natural disasters. Da -da -da, da -da 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 -da, damage reports. What section is that? The second sentence. Taiwan has a comprehensive government system. It'll be in your introduction section, specifically the literature review. So your literature review in your introduction section um, which is in the introduction. Yep. Uh, however, what does that mean, however? It's the problem. However is the most simple way you can jump into a problem statement. So you have, here's the situation, however, oh, now it's negative. Now we know there's a problem coming. However, the labor and time consumption procedures are inefficient. So we're having an inefficient problem. Um, yep. Next sentence in the study we propose methodology. Yeah, there we go. Uh, methodology and study information. So this one's a lot longer. This methodology is a lot longer than the last one. Um, utilizes instant messaging applications, uh, user interfaces. So we, we're gonna, you know this paper is gonna, this is a huge keyword, user interface, instant messaging, um, probably system framework, Disaster related, yeah. These two sentences pull a lot of weight as well. And then finally, we evaluate it. What section is that? Sorry? Results and discussion. Yeah, we evaluated. So the, the results, specifically 58 minute time cost reduction. Uh, key results here. Three types of disaster events. They didn't list them. They didn't say earthquakes, tsunamis, and hurricanes. Yeah, those are three. Uh, they didn't list them out. They didn't say, they left out, there's a lot of information missing. But all that information is not important in the abstract. We've got a time cost reduction of 58. That's huge. And you see, they didn't say, we achieved a, an amazing time cost reduction. No, we know it's amazing. We have brains. We're smart. We know 58 minutes, 55 minutes. I keep on saying 58. 55 minutes is huge. So let, let the reader interpret those results on their own. Um, yeah. Now, if it's unclear, if, it, if the time cost reduction is five minutes or three minutes, maybe that's important because maybe the original time was six minutes and then your time is three, you cut it in half. Right? So you would change this number to a 50% time cost reduction. So here, it's almost an hour. We don't, need, we don't need that number because that's obvious. 55 minutes, that's a long time. But three minutes, well, if it's half, say half. Okay, let's do it again. May, oh, we're not doing it again. Make the sentence more concise. The hardest part about academic writing do you agree, Professor? 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. When, um, when we're talking, we don't need to be concise. If you're telling a story, you don't need to be concise. I can talk and I can move and I can, my mind can go around. In academic writing, you need to be a little more specific. And in your abstract, you need to be efficient. You're engineers. You need to be efficient with your English. So here's a sentence with a problem. In the past, several studies have shown that patients with diabetes are more likely to experience fatigue. I know you're engineers, so just ignore the second part of that sentence. You don't need it. The first part is, the, is where the, uh, the mistakes are made. Two mistakes, what are they? In an abstract. This is, this is clearly academic writing, so I'm okay with it. Grammatically, it's okay. But how can we make, the, where's the problem for making it concise? Sorry? More likely? I understand why you said more likely. I would love to see a number here in the, in the paper. Um, but for this, more likely is okay. What did someone else say? Several studies. We could make, you could say studies. You could say studies, so that, oh, that'd, be, that'd be one improvement. There's, there's a, a bigger obvious one. In the past. What does redundant mean? Redundant means you say the same thing twice. Isn't every published study in the past you would never cite a future study, right? Which makes in the past useless for us, especially in the abstract. Um, secondly, have shown. Um, and I'll show you, there's a, there's a corrected sentence. Um, in the past, avoid wordiness. In the past is wordy and have shown is wordiness. Here's a corrected sentence. So patients with diabetes are more likely to experience fatigue during light exercise. So we've taken out the, 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 the several studies completely, um, are more likely. That's just what we're gonna say. In the abstract, we assume you're academics, you're publishing papers. You, we know you've done the research. We know you've taken the time to find good studies. So we assume, we assume several studies have shown and we've assumed it's in the past. We know that information. So just straight, straight, straight into it. Patients with diabetes are more likely. We cut out this entire first part of the sentence. The first part of the sentence is okay. It's grammatically okay. It sounds academic. It's just not needed. We got two more of these. Sentence with problem. The experiment was halted due to the fact that funding was withdrawn. Where's the problem? Due to the fact? Where'd that come from? Is that you? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Why is it wrong? Yeah, you can just say due to the funding was withdrawn. However, <laughs> it feels a little awkward. I don't know why. But like due to the funding was withdrawn. That is right. But we would just say because. <laughs> right? That's what we would say. Um, avoid wordiness due to the fact is wordy. Um, and I, I suspect that this is a translation. I think many languages translate due to the fact. I'm not sure though. Maybe Chinese does, maybe they don't. Um, like Chinese to English translation. Um, and your answer, because. The experiment was halted because funding was withdrawn. And this is one of those situations, due to the fact sounds academic, it feels academic, it feels smart, but that doesn't always mean it's, it's appropriate. Okay, example abstract number one. Uh, we received this abstract. Um, I'm not sure who wrote it. Um, we're gonna spend some time on it. To the author of this abstract, you did a nice job. Just first and foremost, you did a nice job. We're gonna talk about things that almost all abstracts do wrong. 
and we're going to use your abstract as an example. So, I'm, <laughs> so, so just be clear, this is not a bad piece of work. Um, they make similar, uh, there's patterns in this that other people definitely are doing. And we're going to talk about making sentences more concise, and we're going to talk about ordering of sentences as well. So we're going to do the things that we've, that we've talked about. Uh, this is a long abstract. Um, for our discussion, we're mostly going to focus on the first paragraph. If you want to read the second paragraph, go ahead. I'm not going to read this. I'm going to drink some water. Take like three minutes. Get to know this first paragraph. We're going to spend some time on it. Let's, uh, let's jump in. Strong points. This abstract did some things well. Let's talk about them. Effective introduction to the field. Uh, the beginning of this abstract was, was pretty clear. We established very quickly what we were talking about. Um, specifically, we talk about wildfire records, uh, Taiwan's yearly burn, uh, burn area <laughs> in Taiwan that burn an area larger than point, uh, point 0.1 hectares. Um, we have good study information here. Uh, most uh, time, spring and March, uh, in March and April. So this was a, a time specific, um, which is great that we put that in there. And the occurrences in Taiwan, uh, Taiwan's wildfires might differ from typical wildfires. So here's your problem statement, might differ. So there's doubt, right? When you put doubt, that's your problem statement. Um, this is a pretty good, this is a pretty strong introduction. Uh, it has key information on the study's location and environment. And this introduction cues the reader into the problem. Uh, if, if we had this first sentence down here, so let's say it said, the occurrences of Taiwan wildfires might differ from typical wildfires worldwide, which generally occur in arid and hot conditions. The official wildfire records indicate that there are more wildfires. It's just too far away. It takes too long to understand that Taiwan has fires and we all know fires are bad. So they don't say dangerous fires. Every fire is a dangerous fire. Um, every bridge collapse is a dangerous bridge collapse. There's easy, every tsunami is a, is a dangerous tsunami. Uh, another good point, clear results. I like this one a lot. Anthropogenic activities are shown to be the primary cause of wildfires in Taiwan. Anthropogenic means like human caused. So humans cause the, prime, uh, the, the most wildfires in Taiwan. See how much the fast this, see how small this sentence is? And that gives almost all the, the key results for this study. Um, this sentence is super concise. Uh, this sentence gives a lot of information and not a lot of words. Um, so humans cause fires in Taiwan. And we all know, how do you fix that? Well, education. Um, restrictions, laws, right? They're, they're, we know that. And so this sentence does a lot of work really quickly. Suggestions for improvement. Again, these suggestions have, could be applied to every paper I've ever edited. This is not this abstract specific. Um, I believe this abstract might not be framed like the article. It could be. I have not read the article. But I believe it's not, and here's why. The colors indicate different sections. So in the red, we have introduction. And it feels like the main religion in Taiwan is Taoist, Taoism. Taoist festivals involve fire rituals, burning paper money, um, consequently. So this, this feels like introduction. You're talking about background information. You're talking about location information but it's located down here. There is a chance that this paper had two major sections and therefore needed a second part. You might have two, sec two major sections and you might need a second part, but it's separated. Um, literature review is here as well. And then we have methodology in two places. The reason I suspect this paper was written a little differently is because the methodology is separated. Um, However, because I didn't have the paper, if another paper was written like this, why, it, why is this a problem? 
for an average paper. For an average paper, why is this a problem? Anybody? It, you can understand it. It's written well. You understand the study, but why is it a problem? Is it because the same uh, section in different paragraphs? Same sections in different paragraphs. Yeah, but why is that a, why is that a problem? It's confusing, but why? I can think of two good reasons. You can't easily connect them together. So after you finish reading this methodology, and then we go, OK, here's results. And then you start reading methodology again. And it, it's, it makes you doubt. Like, did I not understand before? And then you have to go back and you read again, and you're like, oh, there was just methodology in two places. Um, the connection is if your abstract is framed like your article, and you read this down here, you know, oh, I have to go way down the article to find this information. But if this is not correct, if this is ordered incorrectly, then how do I say this simply? I want to know where to look in the paper to find the information I want. If I, if I see that this is down here, I'm looking down the paper. If this is at the top, I'm looking at the top of the paper. Because the paper and your abstract are ordered the same way. So when you mix up your abstract, you think the paper might be mixed up, or you don't know where to look. Or you don't know where to look. Yes. Um, this is a great example that uh, this happens often. I often move sentences in, in an edit to make it flow with the article better. And it's easy to do as well. Hello? There we go. So this is, uh, a, this is a, a duplicate slide. We, we talked about this earlier, 25%. And you can just see an example of where the introduction, the methodology, and the results, they line up. And this comes back to your, your, your abstract and your article. They tell a story. Um, people don't think about academic writing as being a storyteller, but you are. You're telling the story of, of your research and your, your effort and then your conclusions and your discussion. It, 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 you're writing a book. It's just not fiction. Many researchers tell me that writing their research paper directly in English is very difficult and time-consuming. So they choose to write their draft in their language first, such as Chinese, Japanese, or Korean. Nevertheless, the paper still needs to be translated into academic English for submission to an international journal. UniEdit has a world-class translation service that can translate your academic research into academic English. Please visit the UniEdit website link below for service details and price information. So restructure suggestions. Restructure your abstract to follow the structure of your paper. The abstract and paper should tell a story. Um, on the improved abstracts, the readers can easily identify the sections of the paper and jump to the sections of the paper that interests them for deeper reading. You can jump. You can jump to the paper. OK, write concise sentences. We're going to spend some time here. Um, and the good news is, is this is wildly applicable. So here we have two sentences. The official wildfire records indicate that more than 10 fires are reported in Taiwan yearly that burn an area larger than 0.1 hectares. According to this, according to studies, wildfire occurrences have increased in Taiwan. Uh, second sentence, immediately. What can we delete? According to, studies. According to studies, we can take it out. Um, more, difficult, more difficult, you can do the same thing in the first sentence. Official records. You can also take that out. We know they're official. We know, because you're writing your research paper. You're writing your research paper. If the, if the record, the specific record is important, 
like Taiwan's government, you can mention that in the introduction, right? If the, if, if the specific record is important, but you don't need that here. So we've deleted, according to studies, we've deleted the official wildlife records indicate. Can we combine the two sentences into one? What's the most important part of sentence two? One word. Sorry? Uh, sentence two. What's the most important word in sentence two? You're right. This is, we're keeping this for sure. <laughs> That's staying. Increases. Increased. If you take increase and you just put it into sentence one, you can delete sentence two completely. It would go, the fires increased. An increasing number of fires have been reported in Taiwan. That's what we're trying to say. So we can get rid of sentence two. Let's look at the tracked changes. So here's, if I'm editing, here's what I do. So delete the entire first part, reported in Taiwan yearly. So Taiwan is experiencing an increasing yearly number of wildfires that burn, we're keeping it, that burn an area larger than 0.1 hectares. And we're taking increased in Taiwan and we're putting that right here. And we just, whoosh. and what does that look like? 17 words compared to 32. And I believe, tell me if I'm wrong, these two sent, these, this first sentence and the second sentence, I believe they say the same thing. I believe the information has not changed. Take a second and look at it. Is the feeling different? Not really. Not really. The first sent these are definitely academic writings. Right? This person definitely knows what they're talking about. And this is just a simpler way to say it. Did I click the wrong button? Oh, yeah, this is a repeat slide. <laughs> I was like, okay, repeat slide. Uh, parts may be merged. Always think, always think, can I put these two sentences into one? Similarly, you can separate information. And we'll talk about that later as well. Example B, original text. Take a second. Most of the fires happened during spring, particularly in March and April. March and April are the ends of the dry season, and the temperature becomes warmer during this period. The occurrences of Taiwan's wildfires might differ from typical wildfires worldwide, which generally occur in arid and hot conditions. There's a lot I like about this. Um, we're saying during the spring, particularly March and April. Maybe not everybody knows that Taiwan's in the Northern Hemisphere. Some places the spring is, you know, September. Um, is that necessary to make sure people know where Taiwan is? I don't think so, but I appreciate it. Um, the dry season, that's important. I'm from the US, I don't know Taiwan has a dry season. When I was in America, I could think that Taiwan had seasons like, I know you're north enough to have maybe winter, spring, but a dry and a wet season? I don't have that. And actually, I'm similar, uh, you know, on a similar part of the planet on the, what's it called? Yeah, yeah. Um, science is hard. <laughs> science is hard. Um, yeah, Taiwan's becomes warmer during this period. Um, the occurrences of Taiwan's wildfires might differ. So here we have the problem statement. They might differ. Um, I have one small problem though. So arid and hot conditions, arid means dry, means not a lot of water. But right here we just said the dry season and we said warmer temperatures. And then you said however, and then we have arid and hot. Well, this should be the same thing. This should be, it sounds like we're saying the same thing. It sounds like Taiwan also has fires during the dry and hot season. So this might be a language um, uh, confusion piece. So be careful and choose, yeah, choose your words carefully. So here are the track changes. See a lot of deletions again. Um, I took out during spring and particularly, but we're keeping March and April because that's really important because uh, we don't know. We don't know. Um, at the end, we see. Uh, becomes warmer during this period. We've moved that up at the end of the dry season when Taiwan's temperature rises. 
So we're giving people information that they might not know. Um, at the end of the, the dry season is when Taiwan's temperature rises. And then we've shortened this last, the causes of wildfires in Taiwan might differ from typical causes worldwide. So here we've repeated the word causes um, because I believe this paper is talking about why. What, why did it happen? And we're going to talk about causes. It's okay to repeat yourself in the abstract. Don't feel the need to use five different terms for the same thing. Just repeat yourself. Totally fine. Um, and here's the improved text. Most of these wildfires occur in March and April at the end of the dry season when Taiwan's temperature rises. The causes of wildfires in Taiwan might differ from typical causes worldwide. Um, and we see 32 words compared to 49. Uh, yeah. Any, any questions before I move on to the next example? Sorry? But do you, does Taiwan have a consistent climate through the entire island? Does, does uh, Yilan rain as much as Taoyuan? Hmm? No, Taiwan has wetter areas and drier areas. Does Taiwan have a dry season like Mexico has? <laughs> or like Texas? Maybe no. Um, but for Taiwan, I believe Western Taiwan, Southwestern Taiwan, the climate is very different than Northeastern Taiwan. So this is where I would make the assumption that yes, many people might say Taiwan dry season, but if you know specifically, there might be areas in Taiwan that do, but not all of Taiwan. Tainan, not Tainan. Tain oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good point. Introduction section. We're trying to be really concise here. So, it, who? Okay, this is great. Who do you write the abstract for? You're not writing it for yourself. So this is a, this is a question. Who is the abstract written for? The reader. Who's the reader? Anyone, anyone, right? They could be in Tainan. They could be in Tokyo. They could be in Ohio, Cincinnati, where I'm from. So if I said during Tainan's dry season, is that too specific? Who knows where Tainan is? I recently learned that information, <laughs> and I'm almost 30. Um, I know I look so young. Thank you. You're all too kind. Um, <laughs> so that's what I would say. Because the abstract is written, the abstract is written more broadly, and then as your paper gets written, it becomes more specific. After the introduction section, now we know. We know we're talking about Tainan. Is that where the wildfires happen? I don't, I don't know. I think I remember looking at the map and it was like, it's more Western Taiwan, right? Is where the wildfires happen. Maybe not important, but you would find out. That's where the introduction comes in handy. I'll give you more information. Um, example C, here's the original text. Take a moment to read this again. Refresh your memory. And here's where I think we can learn um, quite a bit. right in line with the last point. Okay, so let's look at the first sentence. Consequently, this study aims to identify factors influencing Taiwan's wildfires. Again, this all feels really well written. Um, consequently is a transition word you might not need it, right? It's the abstract we know. We know, you're, we, know it's all, we know it's related. 
We know every sentence is related. So we might just be able to delete consequently. Um, this study aims to identify is a little vague. You might, you might be able to say this study identified. This study identified five, right? It, it doesn't really matter. Identified five materials that could be used in future construction projects. Um, investigates wildfires. Okay, we have a date. This is great. It's simple. We know it's, we know it's relevant. Sometimes you don't need the date. Sometimes you do. Um, I think it's okay here. Uh, to determine whether temperature affects wildfires in Taiwan. This is a little more specific, um, and it's, I almost think it should be, I did, well, we rewrote this sentence. So this is a really important sentence, and we made it, we made it feel that way. Uh, the following influential factors are, are considered. Then we show a lot of phrases, a lot of jargon, a lot of industry-specific terms. How many people need to know normalized difference water index? Not many people. Unless if you're a professional in the field, then everybody knows it. But for the general audience, we can, we can delete that. Leaf moisture, there we go. That's, I feel good about leaf moisture. I know what that means. I don't know what this means. So we can delete things like this. We can delete VT, VPD. Normalized difference vegetation index. These are very interesting for professionals in the field. But for a more general audience, let's put, let's put those in the introduction section. They're useful in the introduction section. Um, same and religious activities. Knowing this paper, I might have put religious activities first. Because the paper finds that religious activities cause a lot of wildfires. So let's prime the audience. Let's put religious activities first because we know that's a, an important. We know that these don't end up being the biggest influencing factors. They are, but they're not the biggest. Here's the track changes. Um, again, so we'll start at the bottom here. We deleted those phrases, um, and then we repeated this information here. We moved it up to the first sentence. So it's deleted, but it's moved up. Um, and it's combined, we deleted this part, but it's combined with this part. <laughs> it seems a little difficult, but let's look at the, the final result. To determine temperature's effect on wildfires in Taiwan, the study investigates the wildfires from 2010 to 2021 by analyzing precipitation, relative humidity, yada, 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 yada. So before they said the following influential factors are considered, and then a good list if you were analyzing different things, materials, dates, locations, by analyzing. Just get right to it. This is what we did. We analyzed. Um, also, when you say by analyzing, that's your methodology. Well, how did you analyze them? What tools did you use? What things? Oh, okay, that's later. That's later in the thing. We don't need to talk about it. Analyzing is okay. Um, before I move on, this practice of making things more concise, I can't tell you. Like, if I edit a paper into native English, the paper becomes shorter every single time. Every time. No paper I've ever edited gets longer. Um, and that's not just Taiwanese papers. That's papers from Brazil. That's papers from Japan. Um, because you are all the best experts on your paper, it's so easy to keep writing because you have so many ideas and you have so much knowledge and you have so much time. Longer sentences don't make your meaning more clear. So spend some time. Every sentence you write, ask yourself, can I make the sentence more concise? Can I combine sentences? This should take up the bulk of your writing, the bulk of your editing. Write a lot for a month and then go through, make it smaller. Um, I've shown you here that we can combine sentences. Yes, everything you write is good. Everything I edit is good. It's all good information. But can you say it more effectively? Okay, abstract example number two. Um, I want to have time for questions. I know we're, we're about 18 minutes away from the end of class. So I'll give you a couple minutes to read this. 
Okay, let's talk about what this, what this does well. Um, this does one thing well that I think is it's probably the biggest strength of this abstract and it's, it's, it's lovely. So strong points. Um, directly into the problem. If we notice this first sentence, first sentence, due to the difficulty. All right, just get on with it. We're, we're, we, got, we got five seconds to determine if I want to read this abstract and you did it. Due to the difficulty, great. Um, and we know we're talking about earthquakes, awesome. So we know it's important. It's pretty easy to tell how important this is. We also know that dams, when they fail, is international news, right? Instantly, international news. If any dam anywhere fails, so this, you know, you got, your job is hard. <laughs> You're building the things that people rely on and take for granted. Um, here we go. This abstracts jump directly into the relatable problem statement. Starting with a problem statement is powerful for some topics. Uh, clear discussions. This is one of my favorite parts for this author. Uh, the 3D DEM analysis is therefore useful and is suggested to be applied to assess the performance of the concrete dams in the active fault zone. That's great. This is awesome. Um, it's so awesome that I might even put this towards the beginning um, as a hook. We designed a 3D DEM analysis that, is, it, that accurately assesses the performance of concrete dams in active fault zones. It's such a powerful statement that it could be first as a hook. It doesn't follow your research paper's order, but if it's a hook, it's obvious. We designed, you don't need to do it, but because this has industry implications, the industry can use it, means maybe it could be towards the front. Tells the reader that this research has implications for real industry. Tells the reader that this research's 3D DEM analysis was successful. Yep. Suggestions? Um, this, is the, this is just the, the big one. Move the study's purpose up. This study simulated the failure of the Shigong Dam. Shigong? How do I pronounce that? Am I close? Okay. Dam uh, earthquake by using three dimensional model based on discrete element method, DEM. Why do we want to move this up? Yeah, yeah, if I want to read the introduction, then I can read the introduction in the paper. That's okay, I can read more information. Is this useful information? It is, it can stay in the abstract, but the abstract stays the same if we move it up. Nothing has changed in the abstract. It's the same. So this study, yada, 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 3D DEM analysis, this dam is a famous dam that failed, right? It, the meaning doesn't really change, but it helps the reader. It helps the reader understand your research faster. So this author believes that all of this information on the history and methodology and stuff like that is really important. So that's okay, we can keep it, but the, 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 the reader needs to find out much more quickly. Because what does the purpose do? It, as the reader, it tells you if they're going to talk about things you want to know, right? It talks, it does this paper cover information I want to know? I'm not sure that this information tells you what that purpose statement does. Um, yeah. Small other thing, I can't say this for sure because I'm not a civil engineer. This paper uses a number of different terms that might be okay. But we have dams, uh, concrete gravity dams, um, engineering structures, hydraulic dams right here. Shigong Dam is a name. Um, there's, there's a couple different words used and terms used. That might be okay for this paper, 
this is just a note. Just be careful. Um, use the same terms often. If you're using different terms, I'm assuming you're talking about different things. And they might be here. You might be talking about different things. In that case, great. Nice job. You've used accurate terminology. Um, but I noticed it. Uh, moving the study's purpose up closer to the start helps the reader to quickly understand the topic of this research. Okay. Suggestions recap. Your abstract sells your research. Since every reader wants to know your research's purpose, put it towards the beginning. Uh, we've got 10 minutes left, and I, my presentation is pretty much finished. So specific questions are great. If you want me to, yeah, 10 minutes. I'm all yours. What's up? So is it OK to move my abstract's purpose sentence to the beginning? It can be. It can be. There's, there's some priorities, because your abstract sells your work, right? But also, I've said multiple times, it should follow the order. But if your first sentence is obviously a problem statement or a, an important fact, that's OK. If it's important. If it's widely important, if it's really only important for a small group of people, maybe not. What I would do is I would make two versions, and I would just ask your professor, hey, which one feels better, which one looks better? Um, specifically, if you're applying for a conference or if you're applying for a journal and nobody does that for that journal, don't do it. Maybe, maybe copy the style um, of where you're submitting to. Um, I like it. I like the purpose first. I think it's great. It attracts readers. Other questions? So good. If it's a fact, it can be present tense. And yeah, if you write in the past tense in the abstract, we assume things are changing, right? Earthen dams were predominantly used in the 50s. Now I know you're going to say something's changing. Today, we use concrete dams more often. Uh, that's maybe not true. But so if you write in the past tense, I'm assuming something might be changing. But if it's a fact, you can say present tense. Yeah. Or if you're writing about a specific time period, past tense, yeah. The 50s saw an explosion, yeah, saw. Yeah, I guess it depends. You don't need a reference. If you say, in Johnson's 2012 study, you don't need a reference at the end ever, because you already referenced it. Because you have the name and the date, therefore you can go find it in the, in the uh, references section. In Johnson's 2012 study, they found, and yeah. Quote? Yeah. Generally speaking, you want to give credit, right? You don't want to steal people's work. No, you don't want to. You need to. Um, so if you do quote somebody in, the fir in, your, in your abstract, make sure you talk about it in your introduction as well. Um, explain it. Where did the quote come from? Why is the quote important? You know, that's what your introduction's for. So you will get an opportunity to say more about it. But how to talk about it in the abstract, I would, yeah, we need to read it. For keywords, do you recommend? Do you think it's OK to put more uh, jargon or technical terms in keywords or more? Yeah, oh, it's, it's a good question. Do you use more jargon and technical words for, key, for keywords? So I, uh, when I make YouTube videos, I have to do search engine optimization. Um, so my videos are findable. And the really general terms, you don't find your video. You find every other video, right? If dam was the keyword for that, right? Hydraulic dam even, you're not going to find the paper. Um, yeah, you should be able to use industry keywords and jargon. 
Um, I don't think you should have six very specific words because then someone like me might read it and be like, I I'm never gonna understand the paper. Then I won't read your paper because it's too technical. And that goes right back to that one of the first slides is, the, is it too simple or too technical? So if you're, all of your keywords are jargon, you limit your audience. If you enjoyed this video and you want to get more super clear explanations on academic writing and publishing, then subscribe to the University English Hub. Thanks, and I'll see you in another video.